first time filming in this room, so here we go. Hello there, welcome back to my channel. It's good to see you here. It's been a very long time since I've done one of these more laid back videos where we just I just kind of sit down and have a chat. Um, I think more than four years now. So this is very overdue. Today I thought I'd like to share my story of nearly giving up the violin to playing the violin freely without a shoulder rest, which is kind of unreal to say out loud. I'd like to share some of my life experiences in the hope that maybe um, even just one of you might find something useful or encouraging from my experiences. And now just a short disclaimer, which is that I am not in any way a medical professional, definitely not a doctor or a physio or a sports scientist. So if you are in pain, if you have any other medical, physical, um, psychological, mental health concerns, please do go and seek professional advice and help. So me and the violin, we go back a long way, long, 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 long way, like 20 over years. So happy anniversary to us. There isn't much of my life that I remember not playing the violin. So I started picking it up unofficially when I was about three and officially about four to five years old. And I've basically been playing the violin ever since. At first, the violin for me was just something fun, something interesting, um, something I was curious to learn more about. I loved its sound. I was interested in how it worked, how I could make it work. Slowly, it started to become clear that I was quite good at the violin. I'm also very, very fortunate and blessed to have parents who were very encouraging. They would uh, attend my lessons with me, they would help me to practice at home, they would put the CDs on them in the background um, while I was going to bed or doing my homework. So I was really able to, you know, take that and run with it. I started to get quite a lot of performance opportunities even as a young child and often that meant in order to complete all of my normal school homework and attend school and also be able to perform whatever piece I was meant to be performing on a particular day. It often meant that I would stay up till 10, 11, 12, like even midnight as a young child just to be able to cram everything in. I don't really recommend that for anyone else but that was what I needed to do at the time and that was what worked and so that was what I did. As you can imagine, I have done my fair share of practice on the violin. I, I would definitely hazard a guess at more than 10,000 hours, which is what people say is the, the amount of time required to achieve you know, full competency in a particular skill. So I definitely clocked up many of those hours as a young child before going to secondary education. Then when I was in secondary school, I went into a specialist music school. My main point is that my body was very used to practicing for many, many hours intensively. At this point, sports science in the realm of musicians was not as well established as it is today, as you can imagine, because the priority at the time was for me to hit targets rather than achieve them organically. I wasn't taught about stretches, I wasn't taught about um, you know how much time you should practice before you need to have a break. I did not have a super solid technical foundation. A lot of the things that I achieved was by <laughs> trial and error and sheer will or force. You can imagine this continued for quite a few years because it was a successful formula at the time. When I started to reach my mid-teens and I was still having quite a heavy practice schedule, um, 
that's when all of these little um, bad habits or you know wrong things that I was doing to my body started to pile up and I started to feel really feel the effects of it there were some points where I just had to drop out of orchestra rehearsals because like all of the muscles in my back just froze up and I just couldn't I felt like I couldn't move I just had to go and lie down for the rest of the afternoon looking back I do know why and we'll come to that in a minute but at the time I was just so confused frustrated because I had to practice I didn't know what was wrong um, and if I didn't practice I couldn't figure out what was going wrong but the more I practiced the more uh, pain I experienced and the more frustration I experienced as well so it was kind of going in a bit of a, a cycle as a teenager that's when I started to become aware of how the body functions how playing an instrument especially if it's not a symmetrical instrument can push your body out of its equilibrium and start to explore ways of how to get back into balance. I did start to seek help in the form of physio and in the form of the Alexander technique, but they, none of those ideas really clicked in like none none of them was was the magic pill so I was going for these sessions and you have to do exercises some of them are more physical some of them are more psychological and physiological and they were giving some relief but they weren't really answering like the big questions for me like why is it that I can't play the violin without experiencing pain concurrently to all of my violinistic issues. Scoliosis was also starting to get progressively slightly worse as well. I don't have a very severe form, thank god, but I do have a spine which isn't very straight. For normal spines there is a tiny bit of an S curve but if you look at my spine it's a lot more pronounced than it should be and so it means that um, especially as a teenager my body started to get quite asymmetrical. This is a thing that is genetic in my family. Um, it's called idiopathic, which means we don't really know exactly what causes it, except we know that it is genetic. You can be genetically predisposed. So I was starting to realize, okay, well, me having scoliosis and then playing an asymmetrical instrument such as the violin, I don't know if this is the best combination, I'll keep exploring, I'll keep pushing on, but it sounds like it may not be compatible. So I finally reach 18 years old, graduate from high school, and I'm thinking about my next steps. I'm having to make a hard decision because I still loved music and I still loved the violin. I knew I wasn't done with it at all in any way. I really wanted to go further. But this pain was such a big dissuasion for me. Is that a word? Discouragement. Let's, let's call it that. It's too late now. Let's, let's use the word discouragement. So this thing of the pain plus me not being able to play in the, as freely as I wanted to, not being able to create um, sounds and colours with the freedom that I wanted to achieve them with was very frustrating. Ultimately, I did decide that I would continue uh, pursuing the violin. I knew that there were still questions that I wanted answered. So that's been about 10, 10, around about 10 years now. Since that time, I have sought a lot of uh, help in the form of more Alexander Technique, lessons, uh, more physio, trying out different forms of exercise, um, going to the osteopath, going to the chiropractor, and I did experience um, short-term relief and overall I would say the pain with my playing decreased because I got more aware of what and more conscious of what I was doing with my body 
without the violin and also with the violin, I started to realise that there was a lot of tension happening when I was playing, either tension that started from the beginning or tension that happened as I continued playing longer throughout that session. So that helped, but there were still some things that I thought, there's something not right here, I haven't got to the bottom of this, I need to keep exploring to get an answer. So over the last 10 years, I was trying to get some answers from the medical, physiological, physical side, and I was also trying to get answers in terms of maybe it's something I'm doing in my violin technique that's causing these pain issues. And true enough, there was. So often if there is pain when you are doing a particular activity, um, it could be playing a musical instrument, it could be doing work on the computer, doing a certain kind of sport, that indicates that there's something that we've done in our mechanism, in our technique, uh, by being careless, by not warming up well enough or not taking enough breaks. And that is a signal that our body is giving us that we need to sort something out in our routine. And it's actually a very useful signal because if we didn't have pain, then we would carry on and we would damage our body, you know, even worse. Yeah, true enough, there were loads of things in my technique that I had to change. In fact, there was there were a few periods, multiple periods over the last 10 years where I've had to literally strip every strip everything away and go right back to basics. I remember being quite upset at like for example playing the same few notes for an hour just trying to be really conscious of every little movement I was doing, how I was feeling while I was playing, that was a big part of it. But yeah, it just took a very, very long time to rewire my brain, rewire how my body interacted with the violin, rewire the way I thought about a lot of different aspects, a lot of different techniques, going back to basics multiple times with different professors. Yeah, those were some trying times. I really did feel like giving up at some points, just throwing in the towel and just saying, you know, this is too much and I'm still in pain. Uh, things are getting better, but I'm still in pain. I don't know if I'll, if I'll ever get to the bottom of this. I think the only thing that kept me from giving up was the fact that I had already invested so much of my life into the violin and I really wanted to see this journey through to its final ending. I didn't want to give up just because it was too hard or took too long to work through, although sometimes it was really, it felt like that. I've always been told, you need to use a shoulder rest. You don't have enough meat on your bones to support the violin. Um, so the violin's gonna be unstable, it's gonna be rocking this way, and then you can't play properly, because you'll never know how to find each string, you'll have to keep finding it, it'll be like, it'll be like a pirate ship on the high seas. Shifting's gonna be difficult because, you know, if it's all rocking this way, and then you're trying to maneuver this way, um, it's like a rodeo just gonna fall off every time. Violins are very expensive and very fragile and very difficult to repair or replace. So I was deathly afraid of dropping my violin, especially doing, you know, acrobatics, etc. But I always noticed that I would get a lot of pain and um, tension where I put my shoulder rest. So normally for me, it would have contact with my body from here um, on the chest bone, across the collarbone, and then going into the shoulder. Talking about shoulder rests is kind of a minefield because that's just one variable to the great mystery of the perfect setup for a violinist, because you can talk about shoulder rests, you can talk about chin rests, pads filled with air that you can get, sponges, Lots of people use sponges. No shoulder rest with a cloth, which was what freaked me out the most. Not even going into strings, the kind of bridge you have on your violin, 
sound post adjustment, what materials these are all made of, what kind of woods these are all made out of, or, or even the bow, you know, what rosin to use. It's, it's an absolute minefield and I think you can easily go through your whole life trying to find the perfect setup and n never finding it. So shoulder rests are just one one aspect that's already very confusing because there's so many options on the market, so many brands, so many designs as well, and some of them much more affordable and some very expensive um, because they say that they will help you to feel as if you're not wearing a shoulder rest, ironically, and that it won't impede your sound projection and your resonance from your violin, so it won't act as like a mute in a way. I don't have an unlimited amount of money and I've already got at home a box full of random shoulder rests that I've tried over the years that and chin rests um, that haven't worked for me. So I was very reluctant to keep investing in random shoulder rests that I would just later discard because they were all giving me the same result as the other which was pain, falling off my violin randomly and not giving me the support that I needed. So I have at the moment two violins that I use. Uh, one is more for performing but it is older and it's more fragile so if there are situations where I don't think I need to use it or I shouldn't use it then I would use my other violin for that. Uh, which is also a very dear instrument to me because it was um, inherited from my great-grandfather but it is younger and it is less fragile than the other violin. In fact, let me, let me go and bring them to you and I'll show you what, what I mean. Alright, I'm back. So, first off, my... Um, let's call it the concept violin. It's got really quite a slim neck. It's quite small, it's quite narrow. My hand is very small and so I physically can't get my optimal performance level if I have a violin which is too wide, with a neck that's too wide or too um, thick. I know some people give their violins or their instruments names. I'm not one of these people just because every time I think I want to call it a certain name, I change my mind the next day and so it's just not a good idea for me. But let me know in the comments if you've named your instrument a particular name and why, why you've gone with that name. I'd be super interested to hear about it. So now we go to my great-grandfather's violin which came into my hands when I was maybe 12 to 14 years old. But well, first of all, it's a much, it's a very different colour. Uh, it is much thicker and higher than my, well, it doesn't look like it's much thicker and higher, but it is, like, trust me, it is. Um, it really feels like a world of difference, um, but it's also wider. And uh, definitely with a much uh, wider, thicker, fuller neck. This violin I use a lot more. Um, for example, if I need it to play outdoors or if I'm around a lot of young children or people, um, people that I'm working with who have uh, special educational needs or disabilities. If I know that my violin is going to be in a very high contact um, situation, then I would tend to use this violin, my great-grandfather's violin. I need to thank this violin a lot for helping me find the secret to playing without a shoulder rest. At some point, I just got quite fed up with this whole situation, as you can tell. I just decided, you know what, today, I'm feeling a bit lazy and I don't really want to take my shoulder rest 
um, from my other violin case. So I'm just gonna play without the shoulder rest. And I'm not having to do super demanding acrobatics on my violin today. So I think I can get away with it. Um, let's just go with the flow. Let's call it the chunky, thick violin, just to make things clear. So I started to randomly play uh, Mr. Chunky Thick Violin uh, without a shoulder rest. Pleasant surprise to know that I could play um, all four strings, different parts of the bow, um, simple shifts here and there, simple bowing techniques, simple vibrato uh, without a shoulder rest and not having my violin, you know, crash and burn to the floor. Um, not completely always playing out of tune. I also haven't experienced very much pain today, but it was a simple day and it's only been one day. Let's try it again and see how it goes. So over time, it started to become um, a pattern where I would be able to play Mr. Chunky Thick Violin without a shoulder rest. And so I started to think, well, if I can play Mr. Chunky Thick Violin without a shoulder rest and not experience pain, then maybe this could work with the concert violin. The world's gone through a very, very difficult time over the past, what, 20 months? 20, around about there. And a lot of us have been stuck at home and a lot of us who are performers have not been performing for most of these 20 months. That gave me a lot of time to play my concert violin without having any deadlines to meet, uh, just to play, to learn some new repertoire, to examine what I was doing. Just a lot of time to do some exploration. So you might be wondering, okay, well, can you just cut to the chase and tell me what the secret is for playing without a shoulder rest? I believe that I can tell you. And a lot of this has happened through trial and error. Uh, I've always admired people who could play without shoulder rest. I just didn't know how they could do it. Um, and I just thought, oh, maybe I just don't have the shoulders for it. Um, I need, I personally need to put some more weight on um, or there's some secret that they're not telling the rest of us. What I found is that it doesn't matter if you don't have as much meat on your bones because for me what stabilizes my violin is of course the contact point here and here but also my actual shoulder itself. So I do have quite a pronounced um, shoulder and it is rounded here and I found that if this makes contact with my violin then that's fine and I know from the back it might look like well you're still raising your shoulder but you know what because there isn't anything pressing on here like how I would have if I was using a shoulder rest it actually feels more free because firstly there's air passing through secondly I can move my shoulder if I want to. So even though I'm not having a shoulder rest to hold it in place, actually it can stay in place without a shoulder rest and I can have my hand completely free and it doesn't move. If I'm playing lower positions, then I don't need to have my shoulder actually in contact, which is the great thing. The biggest secret I found is that playing without a shoulder rest gives you the potential for movement. For example, I don't do that much orchestral playing. So I don't hit my colleagues and they don't hit me, and I can also see my music all the time while I'm looking at the conductor or um, our section leader or the concert master or whoever it is, soloist, whoever it is that I need to be uh, aware of. Uh, I can't move around very much. If I have to go for a long stretch of time playing in the same position, let's say a very long held note, very long slow bows, or playing continuously without having rest um, and not having a chance to do this, put my violin down in, in between, then that really gets the cycle of pain and tension going. I try and avoid those situations as much as I can, which means unfortunately I don't do much orchestral playing because 
a lot of those situations are out of my control. Freedom of movement is the biggest revelation ever. So freedom of movement, obviously, in my technique, I had to learn a lot of that. Obviously, from the back of your shoulder, uh, this ball joint, elbow, wrist, fingers, knuckles, uh, obviously, same on this arm as well. Um, with your head, with your neck, with your spine and your core, the way you sit, the way you stand when you play. So, freedom of movement. If I'm playing lower positions, I don't need to have my shoulder in contact. It can just be as, as it is like that. If I'm starting to go higher up, then I will use this as an extra point of contact. The other thing that I found is the importance of the thumb. I've always known that the thumb is important in violin playing. It doesn't play a note, but it's actually, you know, the deal breaker. Uh, super important for knowing what position you're in and getting around the violin as well. I mean, the revelation is when you play without a shoulder rest, you really become aware of how important the thumb is um, and how it can really help your playing if you use it in the right way. For example, if you're playing on a G string, you would need your thumb to be quite um, near the bottom of the violin. If you're playing on the E string, your thumb would be maybe at the, around the side, but it does need to change the angle depending on what string you're playing. And definitely when you're shifting, it involves the thumb as well. But I found that I can go from low positions to medium positions, to high positions and then back again um, and all sorts of combinations with slides, double stops as well, shifts, um, jumps as well as shifts and slides. This is all still possible without a shoulder rest just due to the two contact points of the thumb working with the fingertips and then and the elbow of course and also the shoulder coming into play when necessary and then going away when it's not needed. So another unexpected benefit is that personally I felt like my vibrato action got freer as well and my violin's resonance also became richer. I haven't done a good enough test in a massive hall. I mean we all haven't managed to be in massive halls these days but definitely under my ear um, my violin sounds like it's really singing and speaking a lot better without a shoulder rest because there isn't anything plastic or rubber or silicone or fabric or metal that is physically touching the wood and stopping it from vibrating freely the improvement in the way it feels when I play my violin and the improvement in the way I feel that it sounds has been a wonderful, wonderful surprise as well. I've recently done all of my violinistic projects without using a shoulder rest. I think I can safely say that moving forward, I will probably not be using my shoulder rest anymore unless there's a situation where I'm having to play a piece which is constantly moving up and down and might get slightly dangerous if I don't use a shoulder rest, then I would probably use it. But in most other cases, I will never go back to using a shoulder rest, which again, sounds really strange for me to be saying. I would not expect myself to be, you know, out of all of my peers and colleagues to be the one that was able to play without shoulder rest. So if I had to summarise what I have learnt in this very long uh, discovery and finally reaching the point where I can play without a shoulder rest, I would say number one, don't give up because there's always a solution somewhere and it might be quite difficult to find the right answer and you might need to find the answer in a combination of ways but there is always an answer. Number two, freedom of movement and being aware of what you're doing, stopping tension as soon or as close to as soon as it begins is 
very important and very vital if you want to avoid having pain and having problems which then might need you to stop playing you know for very long periods or for life permanently if after watching this you think I would still like to play with my shoulder rest because I found one that works for me um, it's comfortable I like it it gives me the support I need I would still recommend that you try playing maybe for a few minutes or maybe for one day out of your practice schedule uh, without a shoulder rest because it really forces you to be aware of what you're doing with your body exactly. The way you're standing, the way you're holding your instrument, especially with your thumb, how you shift, how you vibrate, um, how you go across strings. I found that it helped me to be much more aware of what I was doing. Once you are aware of what you're doing and you can pinpoint exactly what you're doing that might be causing an issue, then it's much easier to be able to find a solution to change it and fix it if something is not working. And another thing I would take away is there is a right technique for you to play the violin somewhere in the world, but nobody will have the right recipe that's exactly tailor-made for you. Every person's body is different and every person's violin and bow and the way they interact with the violin and bow is going to be different and so I would encourage you to never stop learning to always keep trying new things and tweaking things um, because only you will know your body best not even the best professors in the world can know exactly how it feels to play your violin or your bow in your body um, so keep watching, keep observing Keep asking, keep learning, keep experimenting. So that is my story of how I got from almost giving up the violin to being able to play freely without a shoulder rest. If you've managed to get to the end of this story, I congratulate you because I think this video has gone on for too long frankly it's going to take me a while to edit it and put it together thank you so so much i would love 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 to hear if anyone else out there experienced some of the same things that i went through or if you also have scoliosis and play um a stringed instrument if you have also been through a similar journey of playing for most of your life with a shoulder rest and then also now not playing with a shoulder rest and how that journey was for you and if you wanted me to discuss about any other aspects of violin playing yeah chuck it all down there as well and in the meantime if you could give this video a like and share it with friends your teachers your family members and subscribe to my channel i would be very very grateful indeed. I know most of the videos on my channel are not of this style. Um, some of them are a little bit experimental and avant-garde and more related to do with PhD research and audiovisual art. But if you'd like me to make more of these kinds of more casual uh, videos where we just have a chat about things and discuss experiences with the violin and music and life then please do let me know. I'd love to hear what you think. So I hope you enjoyed my story. I hope that you found it useful. I hope you found it encouraging. Until the next time, I wish you the very best. I wish you lots of happy practicing and music making, and I will see you very soon. Bye.